Hello, everyone. I am here today with Joe Polizzi, and Joe is the founder of Content Marketing Institute, the leading education and training organization for content marketing, and it includes the largest in-person content marketing event in the world, which is called Content Marketing World. Joe is the winner of the 2014 John Caldwell Lifetime Achievement Award from the Content Council, and Joe just released his, his fourth book called Content Inc., and I highly recommend it because his third book, Epic Content Marketing, was named one of the five must-read business books of 2013 by Fortune Magazine. And if you've ever seen Joe in person, he will be wearing orange. Joe, how are you doing today, and are you wearing your orange color? I, I, Dave, thank you for having me. I actually don't have any other clothes besides <gasps> orange, so I don't oh. really have a choice anymore. <laughs> it's basically, I, uh, you, you, I open you, up the closet, I, uh, it looks like the <laughs> you know the briefcase from Pulp Fiction, uh, glowing orange, and, uh, yeah. and I just you know pick out my, my duds for the day. That's just how it works. <laughs> Oh, cool. You scared me for a little bit when you said you, you're not wearing any. I was like, whoa, whoa, Joe, it's not that uh, kind yeah, of podcast. Yeah, exactly. It's a family show. This is a family <laughs> show. So, yeah, absolutely. Happy New Year. It's uh, it's uh, it's good to be alive. And, uh, yes, I'm I'm wearing my wear orange tomorrow and the next day and the, and the next day after that. <laughs> oh, cool. And today uh, we are going to be talking about content marketing with Joe, and we're going to be doing a review of the new basics for content marketing in 2017 and beyond. Very excited to dig in where uh, one thing we didn't mention in his bio, Joe is the uh, pretty much official godfather of content marketing, coined the term content marketing. He knows content marketing, breathes, lives it, eats it. So we are going to hear from the best in the business today. So, so if you don't like Joe, content marketing, you can just stop listening to this. Right yeah, now. yeah. If you don't want to talk, if you don't want to listen to my content you marketing, then, then <laughs> if, it's, if it's content marketing is not what you're interested in, this is not the podcast. For this you. is not. This isn't yeah. for you, no, sir. <laughs> All right, well, to kind of dig in here, but before we get into the specifics, and I'm going to want to <clears throat> get some specifics out of you, sure. but I, I just want you to give you an over, have you give an overview of where you see the content marketing landscape. Has it fully matured? Is there still room for growth? Um, do you see this method of marketing staying the same, growing in the coming years? What, what's your assessment of where we stand? Well, I think just, you know, just the level set, I don't know, depending on, on who's listening, but, you know, content marketing is the idea that, to attract and retain customers, we're, we're going to create valuable, compelling, and relevant content, relevant information on a consistent basis. It's very similar to what a media company will do, but instead of monetizing it like a media company does through, let's say, paid subscription or advertising, we're trying to sell more products and services. And as an approach, content marketing is well over 100 years old. One of my favorite examples is John Deere's The Furrow Magazine. Uh, they've been doing that magazine now digital and print for 120 years. They have 1.5 million subscribers, 40 countries, and 14 different languages. And it's, if you look at the history of John Deere, it's a great example because John Deere is John Deere because of that loyalty effort that they've been able to build all these years. So it's, you know, content marketing is not a new thing. And then in 2000, let's say the mid 2000s, when, you know, Google search engines started to become uh, more prevalent, and we started to use our smartphones more, and then social media came into play. Uh, the, con the control has gone to the consumer. So now the consumer can get in any information they want. They've got Obviously, they've got a smartphone device with them. They can get access to information 24-7. And so we can't just tell people, buy our products and services anymore, because if they don't care about it, they're going to ignore us, and we've got to create information that, that's relevant. Now, if you want to ask, mm -hmm. so let's go. You know, let's go to where the industry is at right now. Even though it is a very old industry, it's still rather immature. And even with, let's say, the last 10 years, we've seen a pretty good run with a lot of companies taking on the approach of content marketing. Most companies still don't have formalized strategies. They're still sort of in experimentation mode. Um, there's mm -hmm. lots of opportunities. You're leveraging a lot of mediums. So I think that what I've what I've really seen, and like if you just sort of do a review over the last year, lots of people are trying content marketing, but not a lot of people are committing to it. Uh, it it's something that takes time and patience to really build a long-term relationship with an audience. So what we've seen, Dave, over the past year or so is that a lot of people have dropped out. They've stopped doing content marketing, or they do it inefficiently, or they do it inconsistently and it's not working mm -hmm. for them. So we have a lot of haves and have-nots. The ones that have committed to it, 
They really focused on a target audience. They deliver value to that target audience every day, every week, every month, whatever the case is. They're successful. They're finding a lot of um, amazing uh, examples that are happening, and, and they're changing co co customers' lives in certain ways, and then they're seeing that profitable behavior on the back end, and the ones that don't commit to it aren't seeing those types of things happen. Yeah, yeah, and I'm I'm living breathing proof of that, and yeah, and we, um, you know, we're we're you know, at our marketing firm here, we're we're taking a stand against that too, in the sense that, listen, we'll take, you know, we don't want to take a little bit of money from you, you know, we want a lifetime client, so we're we're not even moving forward anymore unless people are are fully committed because, it's not just the, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but. You know, there's other benefits that take time as well. Uh, you know, you have the, the search engine, the SEO benefits of all that. But as we all know, all these are long-term benefits. Now, you're building a brick house, and there's long-term benefits of it. But for that stuff to kick in, it takes time. You know, to get the trust built up, that takes time. And if you don't give it time, it's it's just you're not going to get all the way through. And if you quit doing it or you do it half-assed, then – it's like you're trying to put out a, a, you know, like a forest fire, right? And if you just sprinkle a little bit here and there, you got to go at it if you're going to put no, it out. I love that. No, you're absolutely right. I mean, one of the things I sort of enjoy when I go into a company, I tell them that they don't have to do this. You know, you can mm -hmm. just do, you could just advertise and do traditional PR and work on referrals and and do the same things that we've done for the last 20, 30, 50 years, and that's fine. You don't have to do content marketing. Now, I feel. The content marketing can be a competitive advantage, but in order for it to work like you're talking about, you actually have to invest. I was telling somebody, I was on an interview the other day, we were talking about ROI, return on investment. And to get the R, Robert Rose says this all the time, my my partner on our on our podcast, This Old Marketing, is to get the R, you actually have to do some I. So you have to <laughs> actually do some investment to get some of that return, and that does take time. And whether you're talking about building an email subscription list or getting found in the right search engine keywords or building an audience and a following on social media platforms. Those things all take time. And if your time frame is, let's say, less than 12 months and you don't have the patience to go through sort of this experimentation phase and, and figure out, the, you know, all the, work out all the kinks, if you will, then you might not want to do it. Because it's most likely, 90% of the time, you're going to see – the benefits happen after that 12-month time period. Yeah, but then talk about that, though, because, um, you know, it, it's just like, it's just, you know, sales is a very fine line when you're, you know, or when you're trying to explain or, you know, even if you're just doing, you know, giving advice to somebody, but you don't want to scare them away from it, but you want to be as genuine and honest as you can about it as well. So it does take time. So if you need like super quick fixes and you, you know, you need that to happen right away, well, you know, it's probably not for you, but if you do build up that and you do, we'll talk about like what, you know, paint a picture, you know, after that 12 months, what's happening? You know, it's not just like you're placing an ad that goes away or you're doing SEM that goes away or you're doing direct mail that yeah. goes away once you do it. So, you know, talk, talk a little bit about that because I, I definitely don't want to scare people away from it, uh, but I want to, you know, at the same time be as accurate in, in setting the stage. And when you put out that 12-month time frame, some people are like, well, that, you know, what kind of marketing takes 12 months to work? But it's it's different, you know, it, it's solid. It's it's The foundation is, is just will will set you up for life but in your words how do you how, how would you paint that if you do do the investment and you do get to that year mark what 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 can one expect well it's, it's funny i mean you you've you've gone through this and we've gone through this as well at content marketing institute of course we used content marketing to uh to be able to get to a point where we were able to to sell our company last year and, and i was able to reach a lot of personal goals you know when i start so i started my blog uh this was in april of 2007 and we started a blog consistently. We built the e-newsletter. Didn't have much of an audience for the first six months because you don't get found in Google. You're starting from basically zero. And to get a lot of that content out, you're going to actually have to pay for some social advertising and pay for some pay-per-click because nobody knows who you are. I mean, if you're lucky enough to start with an audience and start with a, a database of subscribers, that's great. But it absolutely takes time. And 
when we got to, let's say, the 12 to 18 month, we're starting to see, oh, we've got a couple thousand email subscribers. This is starting to work. And you can actually start to look at the data and say, oh, there's, there's a customer. There's a customer that came from, oh, they came from, uh, from th doing this search. They signed up. They downloaded our ebook. They signed up to our email newsletter. And then, lo and behold, three months later, we've got a customer. And I can start to track that. And that, that didn't, those, those things didn't happen until we got to the 12-month mark. Then you get to the two-year mark, and I'm like, oh, my gosh, we've got 10,000, 15,000 subscribers. Things are really working. We're actually driving direct revenues off of some of our content. We're actually, you know, we, then we started an, an event like a content marketing world. Oh, we, we were able to double the number of people going to that event. Why? Because they found us on search, they found us on social, and then they were interested in our products and services once we started to build that relationship. And then, it, you know, then in year three, things just blew up. I mean, things are just mm -hmm. because we started to get found for almost every major search term in our category. Uh, we got mm -hmm. joined. Now we're at, um, you know, 200,000 subscribers. I mean, I'm not saying – the numbers don't really matter because it depends on what size business you yeah. have, whether it's consumer or B2B. The point that I'm trying to make is, is that if you can weather through – the first nine to 12 months and just take the wins for what they are. It's like, great. Oh, we had this really good qualitative feedback that, um, you know, this person that they got our email newsletter, they absolutely love it. And they've been opening it for the last few months. And we started, we're starting to get more traffic coming in and we're starting to get more shares on social media. And you take those, what we call more vanity metrics and you take them for what they are. And you're like, great, this is a really good start. We're seeing some positive momentum. Then you want to do things like build that email subscription list and those things to start working. So mm -hmm. um, that's, that's sort of the journey that you have to paint. The unfortunate thing is, Dave, most people don't get to that 12-month mark because you just, especially smaller businesses, they just get diverted into doing the business. It's like, oh, we, mm -hmm. you know, we want, we, I got, I got to do this. We can't find somebody to write the blog today. Or, you know, that email, how important is getting that email newsletter out? It's critically important, but, you know, work gets in the way. So that's why you have mm -hmm. to commit to it and say, look, we're going to do this for the first year. Then we're going to sit down and see how everything's working, obviously tweaking it along the way. So that's sort of the journey. And what mm -hmm. you're talking about is building an asset. That's So honestly, I mean, not that you – it's not a – we're going to do this in place of advertising or we're going to do this instead of PR. It all works together. I mean, we, we think mm -hmm. that content marketing makes advertising and PR better. But at some point – You have something you have something to advertise that's not about saying, look at me, you know, a hundred exactly. times in a row. Well, the other thing mm -hmm. is, is that when you build your own audience, you technically don't have to advertise. You don't have to pay that fee anymore, that turnpike fee, if you will, to get in front of an audience because you actually have the audience. So that's where it pays off in the long run because this is like an annu it just it's an annuity. It just keeps building over, you know, month after month. It gets bigger. That's you grow your audience. Yeah. You get mm -hmm. found and you can once you're found in search, it's very hard to not you know to lose that uh, ranking. I mean, you move up and down, but if you're a credible site, Google continue will continue to drive traffic to you. So those things are long-term assets that can continue to work, and you're gonna you can actually say, oh look, we. We maybe don't have to spend as much in certain areas as we used to because we built this asset, and then uh, it sort of uh, snowballs, and you see these amazing effects, effects happen mm -hmm. year after year. Yeah, and, and just to you know, <clears throat> put some of this in context, like you know, Google sometimes takes five to seven weeks to even recognize something that's even happened, let alone it start to to move the needle on something. I mean, that's just that's just the nature of the beast. So I mean, that you know, that's that's you're going on one to two months just right then and there, you know. So if people want to, I did this, and why am I not growing right away? <laughs> well, it just, well, they it might not even know you even did anything. Well, well, it's a great point. It takes a while to build a credible site in the eyes of Google. That's why a lot of this stuff takes it takes time because you, people start linking to you. They start sharing your content. Google starts to notice those links, especially from credible sites. And then as you produce content, they're paying attention. Like if you're a brand-new site, and you have no credibility, Google's not even paying it. They don't even know you exist. They only know mm -hmm. you exist when you start to help people and they start to go to that content and engage in that content on a regular basis. And Google looks up and says, hey, 
it, that site is actually delivering really good, solid results. Let's start looking at that. So they start paying your site more often. So now, like mm -hmm. contentmarketinginstitute.com, if we produce, we, we uh, publish our piece of content every day at 6 o'clock in the morning. By 6.05, Google already has that indexed. Well, but that's because yeah, that's we're a pretty you. credible <laughs> site, and we've been working on it for 10 years. Yeah, but that's yeah. how it that's yeah, how but that's where you. Yeah, I know, exactly. But for other people, yeah, there's a lag in what Google will index. But if you continue to do it and do it and do it, then, then you just start to snowball. Well, cool. Did you I think like we've another media company. Like, yeah, just like the New York Times or the Washington Post that as soon as they publish something, you know, Google and Bing and, and other, you know, other outlets are paying attention because you actually deliver really good quality information and not just sales information that nobody really, really cares about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, uh, content marketing is is probably the number one tool for building your SEO, and that's where I think a lot of people don't understand. Um, you, you talk to any SEO ex expert, and I've had a lot of them on, on our podcast here, and um, they all, every single one of them, uh, the biggest part of their link building and their SEO strategy is the content. And now there are other ways to go about it, you know, just getting your general, you know, for local stuff, getting your general citations and getting there's some basics. There's a lot, lots and lots and lots of basics yep. that you need to do. But overall, um, it's the best SEO tool there is. And that's another like benefit. You know, if you start getting found in those search engines, you are going to kill it. But it is Take, it's just taking, you know, the new normal is it just takes a little bit longer. The benefits are still the same. It's just it's gotten pushed back a little bit. But with everything these days, I mean, how many people, you know, accept telemarketing calls? You know, everything's getting crowded out there. So, so it's it's just you know just like with anything else, it's just you know you gotta you know you gotta just stick with it. Now, th um, I think we've painted a very fair picture. You know, nothing that's you know. Um, over the you know over the top saying oh you're going to kill it in a month and, and you know nothing that's saying it will never work you know this is I think we've set a very fair picture and, and you can make a decision for yourself if you want to go build a long term brick house um, this is the way to go so to to move on I um, I've seen you and Robert Rose talk uh, a bit more and more lately about purpose driven marketing can you can you dig into this. Um, for us, as it seems to be driving up to the uh, top of the importance for uh, content marketing plans. Well, it's you know our our friend uh, you know there, there's a there's a lot of people in the industry right now that are talking about the why behind what we publish, and I think it really comes down to doing <laughs> creating information that's so important to your customers. It sort of goes beyond what you sell. Like it's interesting if you look at Starbucks right now. They have a campaign called Upstanders, which basically they're highlighting heroes that we don't normally get to see. They're sort of trying to uncover heroes, and Starbucks is putting the money behind this because they have a greater purpose. And base, a lot of their content is actually behind veterans' activities. And Starbucks has been behind veteran activities for a long, long time, and they've been they've been going after that community. So they're starting to create videos and content around those types of things. They have a higher purpose and really focusing on that community. So as you think about like what is your higher purpose, you really the, the focus is of course it's on what you believe in as an organization and what's important to you more than what you sell, but you have to connect that with what your audience's needs and pain points are. And that's what we call that sweet spot. And if you find that, that's where you can really make an impact. And a really good um, you know, if it, there's an activity to to take a piece of paper and sort of look at who that audience is you're trying to target. That could be your customer. Um, it could be a prospect, a group, whatever it is. And, and then write down, you know, what's really important to them that we can focus on and we can deliver information to them that's going to solve their, their needs and help them get a better job, live a better life in some way. And then on the other side, put the stories that are important to you. What are things that, that like, for example, with Content Marketing Institute, we're, we're really involved in speech therapy for children that need speech and play therapy. And we started a foundation called Orange Effect Foundation, and everything that CMI does and when we give, we focus on, you know, th that type of information around and giving around speech therapy. That's a higher purpose for us, us, and we've created some content around that. Not that you have to do that, but list those types of things that are important to you. And if you find a match there between what the audience's needs are and what the things that are really important to you as a, as a company, 
that's where you can really find a higher purpose. And there's a lot more companies, uh, like Chipotle is a good example, where they talk about sustainability and food. And they've done a number of videos around that. And it's, sometimes that gets a little bit more traction than just, oh, here's an industry niche and we're going to answer all the questions in that industry. That's a fine strategy. You can do that. It's really good for SEO. But sometimes when it's so crowded in an area like that, you've got to think of a storyline that's a little bit different that sets us apart. And you can mix them together. You can blend those two, can't you? Absolutely. I mean, the, the great thing about this is publishing. There are no rules to this. Mm -hmm. You can focus on and that's why it will always be around because you can always create a niche upon a niche. I mean, I grew up in, you know, as you did, you know, we grew up in publishing, B2B publishing and B2B media. and. You think that, oh, man, how many different niches can you have? Well, it's unlimited. There's always uh -huh. another information area. I mean, I've been doing a lot of research in artificial intelligence, and there's all these different sub, new sub-content uh, niches that are just being created because these technologies are changing and there's more information that's needed. So the exciting thing is if you go toward a higher purpose strategy or content marketing strategy, there's probably no shortage of areas that you could focus on. Gotcha, gotcha. Now, I uh, appreciate all that. I, I think that, you know, was going to start unlocking people's thought processes of not just, now granted, you do need to answer questions. You do need to do all that. But if you can, you know, take a step back, like, hey, why are we doing this? You know, why, what are we, who are we really trying to help out? Well, we, hey, we really want to help moms learn about X, Y, Z. You know, we really want to, you know, do that. And then if you can mix that in with the cause, well, then, Bingo, you're, you're huge there. Now, another thing, and you kind of touched on it a little bit, documentation, and, and um, that kind of flows into, you know, workflow planning. And at CMI, you all have done an amazing job, you know, with your templates and all kinds of amazing stuff. And trust me, I'm, I bookmark <laughs> tons of stuff that I go over with my team on a, on a weekly basis. Uh, but you guys do an amazing job of continuing to refine and define the best practices for helping to keep marketers focused and on task. Because this is a lot of stuff. There's a lot of moving parts, a lot going on. So I'd like for you to talk a bit about the best practices for marketers when it comes to workflow and, and, and if there's anything that's possibly new that you've learned, you know, over the course of the last six, 12 months or so that um, in, in this area. Well, I think so we could do a whole day on just workflow. So <laughs> it's not, it's, it is, it can be a challenge, but let's just talk about it in simple terms. First of all, you just have to very simply focus on one who you know who is that audience you're trying to target and what is that content niche. So if we start out with you know what is what is the strategy we want to know who the audience is, what we're trying to talk about, and what our goal is. Like what is your corporate goal? Are you trying to ultimately drive more sales? Are you trying to save costs? Are you trying to work on loyalty efforts? It's really important before you do anything to just really have those things grounded and know why you're doing the things that you're doing. Then you figure out, okay, this is the why we're doing it, and this is the content that we're going to start creating. This is where we feel we can be the leading expert in the world. Then you can start to think about, okay, what what is it going to be? Is it going to be a podcast series? Is, is this going to be uh, a blog? Is it going to be a custom magazine? You can start to visualize those things. And then you break those things apart in their components. So let's just take a blog, for example. You might say, okay, we believe that in order to hit the, accomplish this goal and to build our, let's say, email subscribers, we're going to start this blog, and we're going to blog two times a week. We're going to blog on Tuesday mornings and Thursday mornings. And then you figure, okay, you need two blog posts a week, and you're going to start to create what's called an editorial calendar, which is the most important thing when you're talking about workflow. You have to create an on – it can be as simple as you do this. There's a lot of really good tools out there, but you could just start – with an Excel spreadsheet or a Google sheet just to start with. And you're focusing on, okay, what is my topic? What's the keyword that I'm targeting? Who's the audience I'm going to target for this? What do I want them to get out of it? And who's the type of, who's the person that can actually start creating the raw content? So is that somebody in your organization? Is it somebody you're going to hire outside? Is it an agency? Maybe somebody like, you know, Dave, you have a team that can work on this kind of thing. So that's the type of things you want to think about. And then you actually need an editor to work with that raw content. So you have somebody create the raw content, and then you have somebody actually edit that content. And you want to do this. My take is you always get the content in at least two weeks before it's due to publish. 
We don't want to be in a position where Monday we're thinking, oh, my gosh, we don't have the content done. What do we do? We need to publish this blog post on Tuesday. You're already too late. You're going to rush the process. I want you to make sure that you've got sort of a quarterly feel for your calendar, what's needed, and you're working so that when you're completing about two weeks ahead. And then those are the types of things that you want to think about. And then from that standpoint, just sort of complete the workflow, you've got to have somebody that's going to approve this. So who in your organization has to see it, has to approve it? Is it your CEO? Is it your marketing person? Is it your PR person? Is it an engineer on the team that's got to look at whether or not these things are right or wrong, those types of things? And then once you publish it, then you've got all the distribution things to think about. So you're going to be working with your social media person, uh, and you, you're going to be thinking, okay, do we want to uh, buy some advertising to promote some of this content? And then at the end of the day, you're going to say, how are we going to measure this thing? You know, what are we, are we going to look at email subscriptions? Is that we're trying to build an audience? Are we trying to um, look at total number of traffic and social shares, and is that meaningful at all to our organization? So those, that's not kind of a very quick overview mm -hmm. to look at simple workflow, but the key is make sure you have an editorial calendar and you work ahead just like every smart publishing company so that not at the last minute. You're going, oh, my gosh, what are we going to do? Because when that happens, Dave, you're probably going to skip it. You're going to not going to do it. And that's, again, how it breaks down because content is a promise to your customers, and you've got to keep that promise. Gotcha. So in a nutshell, uh, identify who's involved, the roles, identify what each role does, the task, and identify when the tasks get done, the flow, and then stick to it. Um, you said that much quicker. I could have just said that. And we could have taken everybody five minutes. <laughs> well, I was just I, I just was taking a synopsis of everything you were saying, basically. But no, we need you to explain. Yeah, if I just say that, people won't, won't know, know the context. Uh, but exactly. yeah, absolutely. And moving kind of within that, you know, building your team, um, has it changed? You know, who should be involved in this day and age? You know, maybe speak on this for like a larger company with more resources and possibly a one to two person team. Um, you know, are do you have? you know, some input on that? Or has it changed at all? Uh, is it still the same sort of skill sets? Are you merging? Uh, you know, do you see people having merged skill sets these days? Basically, you know, you know, anybody who does graphic design for us needs to understand the SEO part, for instance, now. You know, in the past, you might have your SEO technical people and you had your graphic people and, and writers these days. You know, there, there's a blend of knowledge there, at least from what I'm seeing. So what, what do you see? You know, what's evolved since, you know, even over the last year and skill sets and, and the kind of people that you need involved here? Well, it's a, it's a definitely a mixture of marketing and publishing. I mean, what you've, we've seen a lot of large companies, they've actually hired a lot of journalists, a lot of writers, a lot of editors, because most companies have marketing people, but they don't have people that understand how to tell a really good story. So you need those types of people. But at the same time, to your point, you need somebody that's going to understand how do we distribute this and how do we get that found. So if you think about, okay, you have your content creators, and the content creators means you have some design people, you have some – some writers, you, and then you have need some editors to make sure that content is correct and it's edited and it, and it works really well. And then you need, ultimately, you're, you're starting to see some audience development people. If you look back in, you know, B2B, they used to call them circulation directors. Well, now they're called audience managers or audience development managers on the brand side. And those people that are saying, look, we're creating all these con this content. How are we building an audience? And what is that audience doing? That's a very important role. So we're starting to see a lot of people move from the publishing industry over to the brand side because once you create the content and you distribute that content and market it, you've got to figure out, okay, how are we growing that audience? Because it's all about, at, at the end of the day, pure content marketing approach is all about building an audience that then shows profitable behaviors for our business. If you just focused on that, you're going to be successful. So that's a big change we've seen in the last few years is this hiring of audience development people. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, cool. And to kind of bleed into other people involved here is a sales team involvement. You know, and traditionally it's marketers marketed, salespeople sold. But now it seems like these two departments are starting to be asked to work together a, a, a ton more. Can I get your take here as well as some pointers for how maybe they can team up when it comes to their content marketing initiatives? Well, it's really smart. If, if In most companies, sales leads the charge, and historically marketing has been more of a collateral department. Oh, you need sales collateral. You need to make it look pretty. Marketing will do that. 
Well, now you've got marketing creating a lot of customer touch points that never happened before. So like we've talked about with search and social, customers are going out and getting that information. In a lot of cases, cases they're bypassing sales. So what's happening is sales is really important, still important, but they're doing what you want them to do is you want them to be there to close the deal. So a lot of the upfront, the education, and the nurturing, which used to happen through a salesperson, is happening through content. So if you're a marketing person in an organization, you would be very well served to meet with your salespeople on a regular basis, even going on sales calls. A lot of marketers don't go on sales calls. You've got to set some time to go out on sales calls so you can understand here's what the customers are dealing with, here's some of the questions they're dealing with, and you can integrate and talk to your salespeople and figure out, look, how can I make you more successful? How can I help? Is there, con is there content that we can provide for you that your customers are asking for that we don't have right now that can make your job easier? Because if you get sales on your side as a marketing person, it's going to make your job a lot easier. So at the end of the day, you're going to want to show some impact for this thing. And the more sales are using your content, the better it's going to be. So if you're not doing it, go out on sales calls and at minimum, Sit down with your sales team and figure out how you can help them and just sit down and like, what's your problems, what you're dealing with, what's your pain points, and treat them like an audience that you want to solve in some way with some content. And then you can help. That will help you in your editorial planning uh, to create the most effective, relevant content for your customer. Very cool. And that kind of really leads really good into, you know, this next question about buying stage content. Um, you know, there's this is also something that you've heard people talk about more and more lately, not necessarily buying stages. That's been around for quite a bit and talked to, talked about quite a bit, but producing content for the different stages of the buying cycle. And um, for the purposes of, you know, clarity here, let's just talk about three stages of buying cycle. You know, they can go three, five, or seven, but let's just go with awareness, consideration, and buying to, to keep it easy. Sure. But uh, can you talk a bit about some of the new pra best practices here, basically, like how much content for each stage, you know, best practices for staying organized here, best practices to serve this content up at the right time, et cetera? Well, first of all, I have to throw out that there's no perfect way to do this. So there, there's, okay. there's, there's nobody out there who's going to say, this is the way that it's done. It's because tough. everyone is different. But what I will say is this. We get a lot of people out there that are trying to figure out the buyer's journey. And they're like we had one customer that had it down to 51 points. There's 51 little micro decisions. Oh, my goodness. That I know that the customer's making. And how do we create content for every 51 of those areas? And you know what? You're not. And if you try to create content for those areas, it's going to drive you crazy. So what we want to do is we want to focus on almost to your, what you, to your point, what you said is create this very good awareness experience where most of your content is probably an awareness. This is problem solution, solution content. It's not about your products and services. It's about solving the pain points of your customers. You're ask, answering a lot of questions. That's when you get into a lot of that higher purpose content. So that's your awareness experience. Then you have a very, a really, really good like pre-sales uh, experience. This is where you have all your products and services, your co your case studies, your testimonials. Those are all there. So when somebody's ready to buy, they've got all the information they need, really well presented. There's a good path to doing that. And then you want an exceptional loyalty experience or retention experience. So once they've purchased. How are you communicating with that customer on a regular basis? Is it through a magazine, an e-newsletter? What are those ongoing updates so that you're helping with cross-sales, with upsells, with referrals, whatever the case is? And, Dave, I feel if you just focus on mastering those three things, probably with the majority of your content at the awareness level, you've got a good chunk of your sales content um, you know, right at – the pre-conversion, pre-sales area so that that's a good sale, and that's where you want to talk to the sales team and make sure that, that you have what, you, what the customers need there. And then an amazing loyalty experience. If you just did that, most companies don't do that, Dave. If you just figure out those three areas, you're going to be 99% of the way ahead of, of most of your competition. Awesome. And Michael Brenner, uh, I think he um, defines this to kind of put it in perspective. And you've You've said it. You said the majority of your content needs to be in the awareness stage, but the way he puts it is, you know, for every one piece of buying con stage content, which would be like demos, you know, coupons, deals, specials, you know, free bids, samples, that kind of stuff. For every one of those, you need 10 
uh, consideration, which would be comparisons, you know, basically, you know, how you stack up against competition, testimonials, that kind of stuff, to 100 pieces of awareness stage. So the awareness is where you front load your content. And in, in, in my, are we in agreement there? I mean, you, you said the majority of your content, but oh, yeah, is that kind I, of I how you do as yeah, far as the ratio goes? I would probably, I mean, that's probably a fair, uh, fair assessment because, and especially from, you know, Michael Brenner's standpoint, when he, he came from SAP and what they found is they had, you know, 10 times the amount of sales content uh, to one piece of awareness content. With, and if you look at the number, the opportunities, it's completely the opposite way of what it should have been. So they were mm-hmm. so little content for so many people looking for different things that SAP could be a solution provider for. So what he flipped, they basically flipped the funnel around for them so that he could start focusing on the needs because they weren't getting found in anything in search and whatnot. And, and that's actually what most companies do. They actually have so much sales product, service, feature, benefit uh, content, and let's say 90% of their content is about us and about what we, what we uh, have in-house already, and 10% is about really solving our customers' pro- needs. So if you just do a basic content audit on your website, and where the con- you'll, you'll easily find out <laughs> where you're leaning, and most companies are, have very little content on the awareness side. Yeah, for that content audit, you can just create those three stages and say, hey, where does this fall? And then you do that exercise, and then you'll see where you're, where you're negligent uh, with Absolutely. your content. Yep. Cool. All right. Um, you know, to move, to move forward here with, you know, specific types of content, you know, there's a ton of talk about interactive content and video, and I'm um, not in any way, shape, or form diminishing the importance of those. Those are super important. But with all the talk about that stuff, is the – is the written word, is it going to be less of a priority? Is that the case at all? Do you see that? Or um, is there a blend still? What, what's, your, what's your take there? Uh, well, first of all, look at things like audio content and video content. Very um, can be very important, very impactful. But if you're going to do that, you've got to make sure they're consistent. Like, for example, you know, if you're going to do a podcast, make sure it's a regular thing. If you're going to do a video series, don't just upload a video to YouTube every once in a while. Make sure it's a regular series about something, just like a television show would be. And that's where a lot of people go wrong. It's much easier to do that for companies in the written word. And where we're actually seeing, I mean, the written word has more written content than other types of content out there, and that will be the case for a long time. And where we're seeing a resurgence in written content is because of all the the Alexas and the series of the world, in order for those to work on command now, they 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 need to get that from the written word. <laughs> so mm-hmm. when when you want a it works just like Google. When you say uh, you know Alexa, you know what's the answer to this or what's the answer to that? That could pull from your site, but it comes from the written word. So you see, there's a whole next generation thing happening. I don't want to get beyond the point. But the, but no, you no, no, you're not, you're not getting beyond the point. You're making the point. You're making the point that you, um, you know, Google, I mean, if you want to get the search benefits of stuff, I mean, yeah, you can alt tags videos and, you know, get some, you know, link juice and benefits there and all of that. But if you, if you do just go heavy on those other things, you're basically saying, hey, you better be stupendous at that. You know, that better be your driving, you know, your driving deal, like maybe like a Red Bull or something like that. But do not. Do not assume that the written words is less of a priority. It's it's still equal, and if you even do a webinar or a podcast, scribe those out. You know, put it put it out there. So because what you're mentioning about Siri and Alexa, I mean, all that's Google based. You know, search based. Yeah. Yeah. So you you don't you may, you've, you've you've actually made the exact point, Joe. Um, well, I think you know, I, the, what I would do if I'm if I'm just starting in this, I'm choosing. Like I'm, prob- I'm going to say, like, what can be we be great at and do consistently? I'd say, okay, we're going to do this email newsletter really, really well. We're going to do this blog really, really well. Or we're going to do this podcast amazingly well or this webinar series. And, of course, we want to diversify at some point and do a lot of these things. But if you're starting out, do one thing really well. And if you do mm-hmm. one thing really well, then you can diversify off of that once you build an initial audience. Gotcha. Gotcha. Now promoting that stuff. Um, you, you've touched on it a little bit. Uh, in the past, I'd say past meaning 
12 months ago previous to that, you didn't hear um, a, a ton, and even even at CM World, a ton about promotion of content because it was all about organic and everything. But then when things get crowded, well, then you got to continue to evolve with the world. So you didn't hear a ton about promotion of your content through the Facebook, LinkedIn's of the world. Can can you um, just touch on that briefly? You kind of touched on it a little bit, but can you sure. can you you know kind of you know, set the record straight with exactly, you know, how this new day and age of content marketing and uh, and how promotion of that content plays its part now. Well, if you look at look at, at go go to advertising and look at um, so for every dollar of advertising, you're you're generally spending twenty uh, percent on creation and eighty percent on promotion. So twenty percent on the creation of the ad and eighty percent on the media placement. I would actually look at that. I think that's a fair way to look at content marketing today. So if you create, um, if you're creating a piece of content, or you have a let's say a program, 20% of that program's cost should probably go to the content creation, and 80% should go to the promotion. Until you build up an audience that you don't have to promote as much, and you actually have that audience opted in to an email newsletter or whatever the case is, and they've already subscribed to it. So that's the way that I would look at it. And then you could look at things like. I'm going to spend money on pay-per-click keywords. I'm going to do things like social advertising to get that content out there. I'm going to buy advertising on certain sites that make sense, where my audience is at. Um, That's where native advertising comes in, where I might actually pay for content on a media, um, a a publishing site that's relevant to my audience. So those are the types of things I would look at. And if you're looking for that breakout, you know, 20, 25% content creation, 80, 75% on promotion side. What about your uh, influencer marketing? Well, what, what are your thoughts there? You, there's you know more and more talk about I me. Mean, you hear about influencer marketing now. You're hearing about content marketing, influencer marketing, holding hands together. Um, can you can you touch on that? And, and is it is that just a method for larger companies with you know a lot bigger budgets, or is that also something you know smaller, medium sized companies can can take a look at? No, oh, absolutely. I, and I would put that on the promotion side of the bucket. I mean, what in? I mean, you need people that are going to help set up those those relationships with influencers. And to think about influencers, this is like everybody's kind of thrown around influencer. Really, you want to focus on where are your customers hanging out if they're not on your site. You know, are they are they hanging out on association sites, other media sites, blogging sites? Are they really influencers? And what you want to do is build some kind of a relationship with them. And the simple thing to do is just, you know, whatever size company you are, just list the five to ten places your customers are hanging out on the web when they're not talking to you. And those could be all various size of size and different kinds of sites. And you want to figure, okay. Do we want to partner with this company in some way? Do we have to pay to get on that site? Just start asking yourself the questions about what makes the most sense. And sometimes it's better to go with the second tier and the third tier influencers than the first tier. First tier, they're probably already rock stars. They're getting all kinds of offers. But the second tier ones, they want to be the rock stars. So sometimes they're a little bit easier to work with than than the ones that are already rock stars. Yeah, you got to build up, build up. And just make it make it make sense, obviously, you know. It's hard to get a fifty thousand dollar influencer on a twenty five hundred dollar a month budget, right? So yeah, yeah exactly. Needs, I mean, whatever needs. makes sense. But some of these are really easy. Some of these are like, oh, in my industry, let's say that you are a, a heating and air conditioning company, and there's a magazine called HVACR Distribution Business Magazine, and you could reach out to them and say, hey. Um, I've got some really good content that I want to create on this topic, and you really need to create. You really need to have this topic, and you're not doing it right now. Can I do that? They might be open to that. That's a very simple way to think about an influencer strategy. It's an old, you know, placement strategy, but that's a that's the kind of thing. That's an influencer. A media company is an influencer, where you may not have to pay for placement, but you have to make the call and come up with an interesting idea and fill a gap that they need filled. Yeah, and and from you know to kind of you know encourage people to do that, uh, understand that um, you're helping them if 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 you indeed do have you know something com- you know really good to say and you have some really good resource to you're helping that media company. <laughs> that's one yeah. less article that they need to write. You know, that's yeah, one well, less you know one more piece of remember. good information yeah. they can give to the marketplace. You got to remember that these that influence bloggers and influencer sites and associations and. And media companies, they all need content. They all need yep. to fill content just like we do. 
Um, so mm-hmm. if you have something that you can help them fill, then then that's saving them money and time. So. Gotcha. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, I mean, they just understand that a lot of people are, are a little skittish about that and say, hey. Get in your head. This is a partnership. You know, you are helping them now. You know, you gotta bring your. You know, you gotta do your part and not just do something. Hey, I have this great piece of content and it's all about me, right? No, but no. If it's all about you know tips, uh, you know what people can do in in the winter time when you know it's 11:30 at night and their air conditioner or heater goes out, right? You know, I mean, if it's stuff like that, well then yeah, that's some good information that that's gonna you know make make them look better to their to their marketplace exactly. so yeah um uh now uh mobile any I, that's not new it's very important it's been important it's growing in importance but is there anything new that content marketers need to keep in mind now and into the future in regards to mobile um maybe any potential tips or resources you can point people to to stay on top of the best practices here well i think the important thing to realize is that if <laughs> here's a very simple strategy Is your content presentable on mobile? Are your calls to action presentable on mobile? Because I think we we tend to, businesses tend to open up a a browser on their laptop or desktop, and they say, oh, everything looks good. When you're probably more and more, and we see this every day, more and more people are accessing content on mobile. Uh, I mean, if you look at international audiences, there's some international audiences that are all mobile. And we're getting that way in North America as well. So if you need to be cognizant of that, and the simple rule is just make sure it's presentable. Uh, And a lot of people call that a responsive web design, where whatever your process is set up for whatever content management system you have on your desktop, it should make sure that it works on mobile. And what you do is you don't have to – and I'm not a technical guy, Dave, but just to make sure that when you check this out, you don't have to have all the navigation and all the calls to action that you would have on your desktop. You probably limit – you know, if you've got that little hamburger menu that you've got limited uh, options over whatever things they want to find on mobile. So it's a little bit different representation. But the simple thing is just make sure it works on both, and if it doesn't, get your IT person on it or talk to an agency that can help you to make sure that that works. That's the, and, yeah, and so most companies, put most small businesses we process. talk to, they don't have that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, we made we made our own mistakes here. You know, we've got some great pieces, and then it's like, oh, dang, it's not looking how we want it to look. So before you publish, just check it. Do your proofing on desktop and do your proofing on mobile and check it out. And if there are some weird templated things, you're going to need to get technical with it. But somebody sh- somebody can help you out with that. Um, okay, cool. Um, measurement. Is there any any uh, any new metrics to to keep an eye on? Anything new going on there? Well, I mean, you know how I feel. I've talked about this. Uh, yeah. I talk about it all the time. It's very, very simple to me. I mean, what we want to see is profitable behavior change in the audience we build. So as you're doing all this content marketing, let's say you, we talked about the blog. Let's say we do the blog, and the call to action on the blog is to sign up to the e-newsletter. Good. Now we've got their name. We actually have something that we can measure. We've got an audience person that we can measure. You can start to look at things like, oh, what types of content are they engaged in? Are they opening those emails? And you can take that all the way into the actual sales conversion. Did they buy? Or if it already is a customer, you can say, oh, well, if if they've signed up to our e-newsletter and they read our blogs, are they more apt to buy? Do they buy more? Do they stay longer? Those are the things that really excite me. Like if I look at – Content Marketing Institute metrics, we know that those people that subscribe to at least three things we offer, you know, the magazine, the e-newsletter, our webinar series, our training series, they're way more likely to buy something, pay money and buy something from us. So those are the mm-hmm. things that we, we look at, and you have to come up with your own. Uh, you actually have to look at the data, make the hypothesis, and move forward, but we really believe that the best way to do that is actually to create the audience, get them to opt into something, and then you can really measure it. Gotcha. Um, you know, uh, to close here a little bit, do you have any favorite marketing technologies, anything new that you that you think is really cool to, for people to look into? Well, we've talked a lot about search, and I'm you know I'm a big fan of uh, of Moz and a uh, big fan of SEM Rush, SEM Rush um, for analytics. Uh, Buzz BuzzSumo is great. Track Maven is great. There's just so many to mention, but you know those are the types of things that I would look at, especially if you're looking at written content. And, and analytics and really trying to make sense to get more people going to your site through search. And then on the yeah, email the right. side, really good, reputable email provider 
with, with you know whether it's uh, whether it's Emma, whether it's Mailchimp, or whether you get into you know mar- if you if you advance so much, you're getting into marketing automation. That's a little bit down the road, but just if you have a really good content management system, a really good uh, email system, and then some other tools that we just talked about to measure how it's doing, I think you're going to be just fine. Cool. Any any other parting thoughts before I have to let you go? Uh, no, I think we bored people enough. Uh, with <laughs> our content marketing talk. So hopefully it's been helpful. Huh, we boring. went through a lot of stuff there. Amazing. Yeah, we did, and we did. It's always a good time uh, talking with you, Joe. How can people continue to learn from you? So uh, anything on content marketing, you can get at contentmarketinginstitute.com, and then anything on me and my books is uh, joepolizzi.com, and then easily, I'm probably easy, easiest to get in touch with on Twitter, and I'm at joepolizzi, P-U-L-I-Z-Z-I, on Twitter. Yeah, J O E P U L I. J O E, yep, you got it. J O E P U L I Z Z I. Gotcha. Awesome. Thank you, Mr. Godfather. And uh, <laughs> thanks, my friend. Time. Always a pleasure. <laughs> All right, man. Have a good one. You too.